you have the uh, I had the privilege of listening to you speak uh, last week about this timeline and after I heard it I said you know I would love it if you could share that timeline with with everybody that subscribes and follows us on social media because it's so important uh, especially if you have doubts about viruses and how they were created and when they started you know this this timeline that you laid out I, I mean hit hit every point just spot on um, do you mind just kind of walking through that timeline and, and sharing sure. that with sure. with everybody yeah because even in Oregon when I get up I'm you know, I, I, you know, some nurses become veterinarians and whatnot, and they would just look at me and go, well, "This can't be." And I said, "I'm standing here talking to you because of this man, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you a timeline history, and you can't deny it. And you can go back in the books and look. And trust me, I, I looked at, I bought $500 books with the MTHFR gene expression test. Those books all went to the dump because I knew when I'd read that stuff, I'm like, what? This doesn't make sense." So when I got the truth, I actually, I, like, when I moved from Oregon up here to Idaho, I'm like, I can't give these books to anyone. They've got to go out the window here. So I threw, I just took it to the dump because I didn't want the false information out. Anyway, so I put together a timeline history after listening to his podcast and reading all of his books and um, just kind of correlating in my own brain what this was all about. So like he says, Anthony says that the virus really started around 1890 and what I've read in the books is that it was a docile virus in the body that actually wasn't detrimental. And I don't know the logistics of how they actually researched it and whatnot, but they did. And the game changer with the viruses, or the virus, was spraying it with the two metals of arsenic and lead. And that's when it was the game changer and it became more virulent. And that was around the 1890s, right? And so when that happened, of course, then I'm sure whoever is doing this or whatever had to find a way to, you know, experiment more with it and get it somehow into our bodies. But they used the number one thing of egg. And they would cut off the, you know, top of the egg and they drop the viruses and they would, they would watch the activity. And of course, I can't imagine after spraying with arsenic and lead and then putting it in egg what it was doing. You know, I, it's something I wouldn't be doing in my life, but that's what they were doing. And so that around 1890, somehow, just use your imagination, because that wasn't put out, and it got infiltrated into the system of people's bodies. And, of course, he talks about how the one guy was, you know, they noticed that the activity in his body was greater because he consumed a lot of eggs. He ate a lot of eggs. I, think, I forget what podcast it was, but he talks about it. And so they The egg that podcast, egg, yeah. Yeah the, yeah, the egg was, like, the number one thing that, you know, would help with these viruses to proliferate. And of course, you know, people don't want to give up their eggs and they have such, you know, like, I mean, they'll even say, even that call that I did, I mean, they came back to me like the next day, well, she doesn't know that I have a farm and I'm like organic and I have these chickens and this is, well, these eggs are like kosher. And I'm like, yes, but they're not because it's got a hormone in it and it doesn't matter. It's like, it's still fueling the viruses. So a lot of people have a challenge of trying to, or giving up their eggs. So that was mm -hmm. happening and somehow, like I said, your imagination it got into the system and around I think when people were getting like the scarlet fevers the rheumatic fevers the glandular fevers like mononucleosis symptoms some really severe sore throats that kind of uh, things were happening before 1912 so that was now the people were infiltrated with it and of course we know how contagious it is so there's a there's three st or four stages to the virus so by the 1912 the um, virus is, was already infiltrating the thyroid and that was, you know, the thyroid where it regulates you. And I'd really like to know how this virus, like, does these four stages. I mean, it's amazing how it goes from, you know, gets into your body, now it's going to the thyroid. Why the thyroid? What is, why doesn't it go somewhere else, you know, but the thyroid? To probably bring the mm -hmm. man or woman down because it has to be, you know, your body has to be regulated. So people were coming in with a lot of goiters. And goiters was just, a, you know, a way for the body to protect you. To wall off that virus so it would bring in the calciums you know, you know use your imagination where it's getting the calcium from probably from your bones and whatnot to wall off that um virus from getting the thyroid but it's already in the thyroid so it really is still have, has penetrated so of course people were coming mm -hmm. into the doctor with all the signs and symptoms around 1912 
and but no one was asking the you know Hashimoto's was one of the doctors and he was like well you've got you've got thyroiditis well I the itis is all about inflammation so well what make why do you have inflammation that's what we should have been asking right but we weren't so we clicked along and you know that by the 1912 to about 1940s it had that time span to proliferate and do its work to go to the what the, the last stage is, and that's the neurological system. To, and that's where it really wreaks havoc and does damage. So by 1940, well, what happened in, it was 1941, at the age of 37, who was diagnosed with ALS, which was Lou Gehrig. And that was the sign where the fourth stage started to rear its ugly head. So that was in the 1940s. Um, and then, of course, we, Anthony talks about the birth of the hormone movement. And there were no signs of premenopausal and postmenopausal women pre-1890. This is all signs of the body going through all of these stages, breaking it down, to now we have the birth of the hormone movement. So they can give all the women all these, you know, pharmaceuticals for, you know, bioidentical or whatever you're doing to, you know, stave off the symptoms that they were they were getting, like the hot flashes and the night sweats and the mood changes. And but no one was even thinking that this could be actually a pathogen in the body, right? Mm -hmm. There we go, in 1964, that's my favorite year. That's the year that I came, that's where I came in here. And Dr. Epstein and Dr. Barr were in the labs and they saw this Epstein-Barr virus. And they attempted to get this information out. And I remember Anthony saying on one of his earlier podcasts, well, they were lucky to get this out because they didn't want the information out. But somehow they did. I don't know how, but they did. And so now that was out as the, the kissing virus, the mononucleosis, right? And then, of course, now we move a little bit further along, and in 1975, we have Lyme, Connecticut, when, in fact, everyone around the world, people were having the symptoms of, of what so-called a few group of people in Lyme, Connecticut were having. The reason being that they blamed it on the tick was one person had a, a she said, well, you know, I don't know if it's a he or she, but it, the, the person said, well, I had a tick bite and I had a bull's eyes rash on my arm or wherever they, the person was bit. And so that took off as the tick was creating the, the Lyme disease symptoms. When in fact, no, that was a sign of the four stage Epstein-Barr virus. And then, you know, here now I'm working in emergency medicine in the 80s. And I remember saying to myself, why are we seeing so much cardiovascular and kidney problems? All these dialysis clinics going up. I worked in Cincinnati at the time. It's like, oh my God, you, you wouldn't believe all the, the stuff going on back then. It was like an explosion. And there were a lot of these cardiovascular clinics going up and, you know, cat, you know, cath centers, you name it, it was happening. And that was indicative in 1986 with the two virologists that founded HHV6, which supposedly from his information, those that virus attacks the kidney and the heart, okay? And that makes sense with my father who had all the symptoms and whatnot. And I had the prolonged QT interval. I had the, I mean, the, um, the um, palpitations and whatnot. So those are signs of whatever and however these viruses are targeting these areas. So that was in 1986. And then of course now from 1986 to present, and remember there's, there was one virus back in 1890. Well, as it mutates, now we're up to 60 varieties today. So it just depends on what variety you have, okay? So here we are now. We got Guillain-Barre, we got fibromyalgia, we got chronic fatigue syndrome, we got um, ALS, MS, um, you name it. We have all of these neurological things that no one really can say, but they can say that your body attacks itself or your genes are faulty, when in fact, if you, get the body clean to what Anthony says, and you've had the positive test for the MTHFR gene expression, but now you clean up your body because there's a pathogen in it. Now you get a test later and now you're, uh, now, now you're negative. Your, your body, so mm -hmm. do you really have a faulty gene expression? No, exactly. And there's a pathogen attacking you, not your body. The body is always working hard for you. It never wants to let mm -hmm. you down. You just have to give it the right you know, fuel and the right substances and, and get these viruses down to dormancy where your immune system can be on high alert. And then of course, the thing comes in, you know, and I would say back in the day, they was like, all of this money and they can't find the cure for this? And that body attacking itself thing, I remember going, 
It just doesn't make sense. I don't, I, I can't comprehend the body attacking itself. But again, I did not know why. But I did ask to myself. You know what I'm saying? So now we know. Mm -hmm. you now I could go in the, the stages of, but really, truly, is and it is another form of the viruses fueling off these mm -hmm. toxins. That's why you can't cut it out because it eats off of those poisons and spews off a toxin, creating cell death. And then you got tumors growing because of it, because all of this cell death. Then you got the tentacles coming up called angiogenesis tentacles, reaching more of that stuff that are being put in the body, such as egg and dairy and soy and whatnot, and all the chemicals such as the, you know, the air fresheners, all the pollutants, you know, that's coming into that, that those tentacles and making that tumor grow. You know, but now let's back up and, you know, don't fuel the virus and you put the foods in that don't fuel the virus and you, you know, all the stuff that he tells us, the supplements and the, and the tinctures and whatnot, you take those in you, that goes up into the tumor and it actually shrinks it. So there you go. That's in a nutshell here. You know, and there's like, for instance, let's take fibromyalgia, for instance, you know, that's a you know, people's muscles, I mean, they're so sore. Yeah, your muscles are really sore, but what's really the cause? Well, the cause is a neurotoxin that has infiltrated that nerve, innervating that muscle. Now that muscle gets, like, pulled on, right? Because that nerve is, like, all balled up, and it's, like, being injured. And now you've got all this muscle pain, and then even greater is it's pulling your joints out of alignment. And now you've got mm -hmm. now joints that aren't in the 90-degree angle rule, Right? Now you got friction, rubbing, pressure. You got degeneration of the joint spaces, and that sets you up for what? More? Where does the virus go when you have all these vulnerable places? It goes right to those areas, and it spews off toxins. Now you got like the rheumatoid arthritis, the arthritic joints. You've got degeneration. You got hip replacements. You got it all. So this is my passion because I see it now, and I can actually back people up and say, no, let's correct this. And got to go from the inside out well it's interesting you know that you were seeing a lot of this stuff working in the medical field yes um and that was probably pretty early on with the whole thing um and i thought it was interesting what you said last week about what the radiation treatment is and how they the radiation is essentially like the mustard gas. Yes. They're mustard gassing Back the people. Back in Italy, I think there were a bunch of soldiers that were killed from the mustard gas, and they were looking at their cellular component with their blood tests and whatnot. So that's what chemotherapy is. Unless, you know, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm not one. I don't want to put toxicity in my body. You know, it's, yeah, it may kill off something. It's going to kill off other things that are good in your body. That's why, you know, people's hair falls out when they have chemotherapy yeah. So I'm just, um, wow. I'm a truth seeker. I see it. And um, I have what I have to work with now. And, you know, now I think that's part of how and why I healed as fast as I did, you know. And not fast, but I, it kept me going. It kept me 